Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Deborah Vesey, President and CEO of the Deaconess Foundation. It is my pleasure to introduce our forum, a presentation and conversation about building economic opportunity in today's labor market. When it comes to economic advancement, low-income workers have long received the so-called short end of the stick. Social science tells us that race, gender, citizenship status, and education all influence one's ability, or often inability, to succeed in the land of opportunity. Recently, waves of technological advancement, shifting economic infrastructure, and stagnant wages have reshaped today's labor market. It may never have been true that hard work would always be rewarded, and today it is even less true. So in this context, we're here today to ask how we create access and pathways to opportunity as our labor market and the entire economy continues to shift. The format for today's forum is a little different. First, we'll hear a short presentation from Maureen Conway, Vice President for Policy Programs and Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program at the Aspen Institute. Then, Ann Glosser, IdeaStream's managing producer of health and education will moderate a panel with local experts. Finally, we'll have our traditional city club Q&A. So let's begin. Since 1999, Ms. Conway has worked to promote the advancement of low-income Americans through her role at the Aspen Institute, a nonpartisan forum for values-based leadership and the exchange of ideas. As executive director of the Institute's Economic Opportunities Program, Ms. Conway founded the Workforce Strategies Initiative, which examines the outcomes of sectoral workforce development. Ms. Conway has previously worked as a consultant for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, and has advised United States Peace Corps economic development programs. Esteemed guests, members, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Maureen Conway. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and the warm welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here at the City Club. Um, and in talking with uh, Dan Molthrop before we began, I was thinking how nice it is to be at the City Club. I feel uh, very at home in a place that's mission is to convene conversations of consequence to help democracy thrive. As you just heard from Deborah Vesey, that the Aspen Institute is also very much about sort of convening in a non-ideological, non-partisan way to bring together diverse leaders to really address some of society's critical issues. So I feel like we have mission alignment here, which is really wonderful. Um, and just to say a, a word about the Economic Opportunities Program before I begin, so you have a little sense of, of the work that we do. Our, our mission at the Economic Opportunities Program is to advance strategies, policies, and ideas to help low and moderate income people thrive in today's changing economy. Um, and we recognize that race, gender, and place intersect with and intensify the challenge of economic inequality that we're currently facing. And we strive to lift that up so that we can work towards a more inclusive reality of economic opportunity in America. Um, our focus on economic opportunity means that we focus on strategies that expand individuals' opportunities to connect to quality work and to start businesses and to build the kind of economic stability that people need and that provides the freedom that pe for people to pursue economic opportunity. Um, we basically do our work through three basic strategies. So we do a variety of on-the-ground research, looking at what's happening in communities all across the country to see how are they reaching people who are struggling to connect to work and how can they um, help them. Um, so we do a lot of documentation of, of different strategies across the country. 
Uh, we also run leadership and fellowship programs to advance innovators who are uh, working locally to expand economic opportunity and to try to support them as they build their important work and also lift them up as leaders and exemplars that other, others can, work, can learn from. Uh, and we do, of course, a variety of convening of both public and private dialogue, bringing divergent perspectives together to explore critical issues related to economic opportunity and to broadly engage audiences around promising ideas. So that's a quick snapshot of what we do. Um, our topic today is work and opportunity and closing the wage gap. And so it's a first Friday, right? So today is Jobs Day. Um, so uh, it's you know interesting to look at the the jobs numbers at uh, 164,000 jobs, unemployment at 3.7 percent. So that sounds pretty good, right? So that sounds pretty good. Um, but you have to wonder: Are these really the right measures for us to be thinking about when we think about how is work working for working Americans? Um, and because there's a lot of anxiety right now about work in America, right? There's a lot of people who are really feeling that work isn't working for them. Uh, roughly one in four working Americans are in, in the United States work for a wage that even if they work full time year round, it's insufficient to lift a small family above the poverty line, right? So these are working adults. Um, and even more people are struggling with the cost of basics, with the cost of housing, with the cost of health care, with the cost of transportation, and the ever escalating cost of higher education that's so frequently cited as essential for success in today's economy. 40% of, of American households can't come up with $400 when confronted with an emergency expense, right? So there's a significant amount of economic precarity. And it's also critical to remember that these challenges are not evenly distributed. Low-wage workers are far more likely to be women. They are far more likely to be people of color. They are also more likely to be young. The gender pay gap has narrowed, but women still earn only 85% of what men do for comparable work. Black unemployment is frequently twice that of white unemployment. And black, the typical black family has just 10% of the wealth of the typical white family. We also know there's been disparate impacts in terms of geography. Um, if you're familiar with the idea of opportunity zones, so opportunity zones are the geographic areas designated by states to be eligible for the opportunity fund investments that were incentivized through the 2017 Tax Act. And if you look at a map of these opportunity zones, you can see a variety of rural, urban, and suburban communities with disproportionately high poverty, disproportionately high unemployment rates, less uh, quality education, um, less uh, uh, lower educational attainment rates, um, more frequently communities of color, and just generally less access to economic opportunity. So it kind of represents a physical map of the unequal access to to opportunity in, in the United States today. Recent research demonstrates that today's challenge of accessing opportunity is different than for earlier generations. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Raj Chetty's work, uh, an economist at Harvard. Um, his work showed that the chances of a child doing better economically than his or her parents was about 90% in the post-war period. And for children born in the 1980s, that dropped to about 50%. So just an even, 50-50 chance. And, and other research has shown that millennials, so those people born later, right, uh, today have, um, despite being better educated than previous generations, have lower earnings and less wealth than previous generations at a comparable uh, age. So, so this, is a, this is a real crisis of opportunity that, that we're facing today. And I want to underscore the importance of, uh, of the changed nature of work in this scenario. There's a lot of conversation around the future of work, but the future of work is kind of here. And we have to think about how we want to live with it. 80% um, of the income going to the household sector comes from wage and salary employment, comes from having a job. This is the money that people rely on to pay their bills every month. Uh, in addition, many people look to work as a source for their health insurance, for life insurance, and for other kind of critical stabilizers that help them build um, a stable financial life. So the situation of work is a significant tr contributor to today's economic anxiety, but it's really you know, a, a, an important contributor to thinking about how happy people are with their lives and how able are they to live the life that they want to 
that they want to lead. So I think it's really uh, great that we're having this conversation around work and opportunity because it really is one of those critical conversations that we need to be having today. Now I brought some slides and I realize that uh, some people may not be able to, to see them. There's a few slides that are on the table. They're also available at cityclub.org. Um, so you can see these pictures, but essentially it's sort of this picture of the, the labor market and how is it working for working people. And there's, there's a set of slides that are looking at the Cleveland area, since I'm here in Cleveland. Um, and basically there's some green boxes at the top. And then there's a line in between them, and there's some blue boxes at the bottom. And the, and the boxes are different major occupational groups, and written in very small font in the boxes, uh, it will say the name of the occupational group and the median wage for that occupation. And those with a median wage that is above the living wage for, uh, what, for a, a household that's one adult and one child, so that's what the line is, those boxes are going to be green. And the size of those boxes is basically proportionate to the number of jobs um, in, that, in that occupational group. And then the ones below are, are below that, that wage. And what you see, and so I have, there's, there's several different pieces. So this data, the data on the, on the uh, is drawn from BLS data. The, the wage uh, threshold is drawn from MIT's living wage calculator. And it shows from their projections, it shows what's the employment now in, what's the employment in 2016, what's projected employment for 2026, and what is the sort of new jobs that are being created. And it breaks it out for all of those three categories, right? And in, and in all of those scenarios, you can see that the, that the blue boxes that are below are, are much larger proportion. It's usually about a third that's above and two thirds that are below. Um, and I did this, and you can see that, that Cleveland looks much like the country. So the next three slides are all for the U.S. And this is the, this is the situation we see in community and community across the country, is that there's basically too few living wage jobs and there's too many low wage jobs. And this is why you have so many households that are feeling the economic anxiety and precarity that they're, that they're dealing with. So it's really a picture of the future of work it's a picture of the now of work, and it's a picture that we need to think about how do we change that picture. And that's the main point I really want to emphasize, is that we can change the picture. If we don't like the fact that most working people can't support themselves on their earnings, we can think about ways to change that. Work is a human endeavor done in the context of human society, governed by laws we choose, decisions we make, actions we take, and values we hold. Technology does not decide. We do. The other point I want to quickly make before moving on is that the data that I've been talking about, it's mostly about earnings. That's not the only factor in a quality job. So just take a minute and think about what is the best job you ever had? And what made that best? Think about what's the worst job you ever had? And what made that worst? It probably wasn't what your rate of pay was. It might have been the people you worked with. It might have been how interesting you found the work, how engaging, how meaningful. Um, it might have been where you got to work, that you got to work in a place you really enjoyed. It might have been where you got to work, that you got worked in a place that was really terrible or dangerous or dirty. Um, whether you felt safe or whether you got to, uh, to, to be with people you enjoyed their company, right? These are a lot of things, so I bring that up just to sort of emphasize that point again, that work is really a human thing, and there's a lot of dimensions uh, to what makes a, a job a good job. One of the things we, we frequently hear when we're talking to, to working people um, is you know, that they really want to be respected for the work that they do and the contribution that they make. And so, so how you feel about your work is, is as important as, about, as how much you're paid for your work. Because let's face it, we spend a lot of time at work. And a good work life is a good life. Um, OK, so if we want to build a future of work filled with quality employment, what do we do? Well, this is something that we've been thinking about for a while now. So since the 
uh, economic recovery began and people were going back to work, um, you know, we started looking at, well, wait a minute, people are going back to work, but their economic situation isn't really improving that much. What do we do? Um, and we're noticing that there's sort of this challenge of the quality of work that's available to people. And this is a really hard question to answer. So what do we do about that, right? So the first thing I did was I, I organized this speaker series, right? This, what do you do? Organize a speaker series. Um, so uh, so uh, called Reinventing Low Wage Work. Uh, so I can invite other people in to see what their ideas are for, for what do you do. Um, uh, we've also been starting to do some, uh, some research on, on strategies that we call sort of raise the floor and build ladders. How do, you, how do you move people up to have a floor of basic economic stability so that they can climb a ladder towards uh, mo economic mobility? Uh, we have a, a leadership and fellowship program that's our job quality fellowship to highlight innovators across a range of different kinds of strategies who are doing work to try to build better opportunity in their communities. So I'm going to share a couple of those strategies. So, so just one, I, I, I want to say, because I, I realize I, I could go on and on and on, and I'm not supposed to do that. Um, so, um, so we looked at strategies in, in, in workforce development, in community development, finance. We brought together people from business. We brought together people from labor in our job quality fellowship. Um, we have people from local government. Um, we have people who are supporting strategies around uh, employee ownership and, and how does that work. We have people who are doing business advising to think about uh, what are sort of the, the, um, the different business models and how can we rethink sort of job design and these kinds of things to try to improve the quality of jobs. So we were really trying to, trying to take a, a multi-pronged approach, right? Because, and I guess that's sort of another premise that I will, I will make here is that I think that there's not a singular solution to addressing this challenge of, and I will just, or crisis, I could say, of job quality, right? There's, there's multiple solutions and we need them to, to try to work together. Um, and we've seen action on a number of fronts. So I'm just gonna give a, a couple of examples of, of organizations that, that are, I think are, might be interesting um, and maybe we can talk more about them. So one is an organization called um, The Source, and I'm gonna kind of put it in the workforce development bucket, but it's, it, because, um, because I met them through workforce development people and uh, they're in Grand Rapids, um, and, but they do something a little bit different, right? So we think of workforce development and, and, and there's a lot of talk about skills and training and, and this kind of thing and they connect a lot, to connect people to opportunities for that. But the primary thing that they do is that they work with companies and they sort of set a table with companies that were struggling with things like turnover and retention and vacancy rates and, this, and, and those kinds of things. And they were primarily, primarily manufacturing companies that they were working with when they started. And they said, we're gonna help you sort of address these kind of things and you're gonna pay us for that, right? Um, and you're gonna see a return on investment in your, in your investment in us because turnover costs you money and vacancy rates cost you money. So what they did was they basically um, went out and analyzed these companies' workforce and they tried to see what kinds of public supports and other supports are they uh, relying on and basically what are they struggling with? Why is the turnover so high? And they developed a system of making sure that people didn't have to leave work to qualify to go reapply for food stamps or to go reapply for Medicaid or to go um, or or if or there was a system to support them if their car broke down and suddenly they they couldn't get to work or they had this that emergency payment that they couldn't afford to fix their car. How can I give you a low cost loan so that you can keep your car and get to work on time still? Um, how do I help you if you have a shut off notice or something like that, right? Because they found that for, uh, that for people who are in kind of low wage jobs, there were these basic things that, pe that they found families struggled with again and again. There was, it was shut off notices were very common. Um, uh, transportation issues were very common. Child care costs, child care costs is hugely expensive. That was very common. And food at the end of the month that they just didn't have food on the table. So these were things that they commonly helped people with. But by helping people build that stability, they could stay at work, they could grow in their job, they could build their work experience, and they could get to the next level. And then they worked with those companies to build career ladders across those companies. So that's one example of a way to think about what are some different strategies to help people stabilize and then advance. Um, another one that I want to just um, 
uh, that I want to just mention uh, is, is a community development investment one. And so that's um, Pacific Community Ventures. And they, uh, and they developed sort of this small business toolkit. And I just want to make one point about that, which is um, it's this job quality toolkit. And I forget what they call it. They call it something else. Uh, but it's, it's meant to um, start with businesses where they are, right? Because not everybody can raise the wage today. Not everybody can change their scheduling practices today. So it gives companies a range of things to think about as they're trying to think about how do I balance sort of, you know, trying to make my company succeed, but also trying to make sure that the, that the workers in my company who are really part of my ability to succeed are succeeding with me. So just to close, I just want to say in the work I've done over the past 20 years, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people about their work lives and hopes. I've done focus groups with women leaving welfare, displaced manufacturers, former coal mine, formerly incarcerated, and others. Um, I think of their stories and uh, what finally good, getting a good job meant for them and their family. I remember one young African-American man in particular that I talked to in Hartford. He'd come to a job training program. He was struggling. He had a criminal background. He'd done really well in the training program. They were very optimistic for him, but he had a number of struggles in his life. And I was trying to talk to him, trying to draw him out. He'd been quiet and kind of hesitant in this focus group, and he wasn't really looking at me. And I finally was able to draw him out at the end of the focus group um, and, and get him to say sort of what is it that brought you to this organization? What is it that you were looking for? And he sort of started and stopped and started and stopped and then he finally looked up at me and he said, I just want a chance. And that's really, really what he wanted. His story always sticks with me. And I think that we have a chance to bring together public policies, business practices, civic institutions, social solutions, working together so that that man and millions like him have their shot to work for their American dream. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maureen. That was really great to hear about, and I'm excited to get in conversation with you. And I just want to introduce myself. I'm Ann Glosser, the managing producer for health and education at IdeaStream. Cleveland's NPR PBS member station. Um, and I'm joined here on stage by obviously Maureen Conway, who as, as, uh, as we know is the Vice President for Policy Programs and the Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program at the Aspen Institute. Also joined by Jill Rezica, Executive Director for Towards Employment, the workforce nonprofit. And Michael Jeans, President and CEO of Growth Opportunity Partners which is a Cleveland nonprofit lending entity that's focused on small businesses. So thank you guys for joining us. Happy Appreciate it. Um, so I, we just heard from Maureen about the need to build quality jobs, not just quantity, but to think about what it means to have a quality job. So I, I wanted to start with you, Jill, if I could, and ask you what are some of the factors that would make up a quality job. We know it's not just wages and pay. What are some of those factors that make up a quality job and how is your organization working towards building more quality jobs? Great. Um, so I think Maureen touched on um, many of the, of the measures of what a quality job is and I think it is important that wage is not the only um, indicator. It's also, we were involved in um, a national demonstration project. It was called Work Advance. It was um, an industry-informed career pathway program that really tried to bring wraparound supports to individuals who were struggling, connect them to industry-informed training, into jobs, and continue career coaching. The, the, the evaluation of that, they asked people, you know, what was most, what's, what drives your job satisfaction? And actually the thing that came at the top of that list was to have some opportunity to advance, to feel like you were working in an environment where you had an opportunity to contribute and there was an opportunity for you to grow. So even though this was a program that was geared very much sometimes where, you know, starting at an entry level, that ability to see what their future could be and to feel like their, um, their employer was willing to make some investment in them, that really topped their list. And so when we think about our work, we really think about um, our work, we, we would call it a dual customer approach, um, looking at the individual and the business. You know, more from a system standpoint, you know, kind of talking about supply and demand. So if we think about from the face of an individual kind of working through the system, really how do we meet them where they're at? 
help them understand what their options are. Um, we have a, a, a man who came to us, an African American man um, named Chris. Uh, he was underemployed at 9.50 an hour, knocking around from job to job um, with some career coaching. He had a criminal background, and that was what he saw as mostly preventing him from moving ahead. But with some career coaching, making him aware of what opportunities there were, leveraging the assets that he could bring to bear, he saw that there was an opportunity to, um, for a career in manufacturing. We were able to connect him to the technical training, um, start at an entry-level job. From that entry-level job, five years later, he increased his wage by 100%. So when you talk about wasted assets, and you talk about here employers saying, I can't find people to fill these jobs, with the right supports at the right time and, and guidance, you can connect people to that opportunity. But it took him three job changes to find what you might say is that quality job, the job that's um, allowing him to earn, um, earn the living wage. And so then it's the whole side, and maybe I'll pass off to <laughs> Michael, about what's happening with the conversations on the employer side. What's possible today? Um, and then how do we continue this conversation that we start changing some structures and systems so we're changing over the long over yeah. the long term. So let's talk about employers. And and one thing that interested me in our, in our pre-conversation was you had said that there are some mechanisms that you as a your organization as a as a lending and coaching organization is able to do to encourage the growth of quality jobs. So maybe you could speak to that in the employer perspective? Sure. Uh, you know, I think there's been a long conversation about the ability of companies to pay a quality wage, uh, a meaningful wage, and the associated benefits. Uh, and, and I think it's a bit misleading. You know, this conversation goes back to when labor was free in this country. And the principal argument was that the companies would go out of business if they had to pay a wage. And look at us today, we're having conversations of minimum wages that are pushing in some areas of 12 and $15 an hour. And so that conversation, I think, is, uh, has run its course. Uh, we recognize that uh, quality job is nothing new. I think most of the folks sitting around these tables have or have had quality jobs that have the correlated benefits that go along with them. So it's not new, but for some reason it's been reserved for some and perhaps the few, but not uh, the entire populace. And so some of the things we do at Growth Ops to ensure that our capital, when it's designated to go toward uh, paying toward wages and jobs, we call that working capital, uh, we ensure that, uh, let's say, uh, we approve a credit for X amount of dollars. The payroll is on Friday in this hypothetical. We will have seen the job description uh, many times. We'll see who was hired, uh, what the wage is, uh, the correlating benefits. Uh, since we've already approved and most of these companies are on a direct deposit system, then we can deploy capital, say, on that Wednesday or that Thursday to fund the new job and ensure that those dollars don't go to um, any other, any other cause. And to use those dollars for anything less is an event of default. We write it into our lending documents so that there is an adherence to the intent of the capital. And do you think that's a kind of tactic that, other, um, that others could use, could adopt? I think so. It's certainly labor intensive. And our work is labor intense. Uh, so yes, it can occur. Uh, there has to be some diligence around how uh, we manage the expectations even when the dollars leave the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there needs to be the same kind of diligence that goes around putting together uh, high income compensation packages and the comp philosophies that go with that. We need to have that same rigor around low income uh, way, uh, opportunities. And, and I want to be clear, I don't begrudge the low income job. There's nothing wrong with a low income job. I needed one when I was in school. Where it becomes particularly cumbersome <coughs> is when that low income job is being plugged into a household that has greater than low income needs. Mm -hmm. And so it's designed to, to, to fill a purpose and as competencies increase, uh, then hopefully the wage uh, moves with it. But when we're asking a low income job to support a family of two or three, mm -hmm. I think we're asking too much from that. And, and consequently, uh, as Maureen shared, the jobs numbers this morning that came out at 164,000 added in the year or in the month, uh, that sounds great, but it masks those folks who are working multiple jobs. Mm -hmm. it, it, it clouds over that, and so we've got a gig economy where folks are working multiple jobs and they're not really making a meaningful wage in any. And, and, and let's be reminded that that's not 164,000 new workers. 
those were 164,000 new jobs. So we, I think we missed some of the value in the conversation and, and we could zero in on it and do a little better. Yeah, and it's a reminder to, to sort of ask ourselves whether the metric is correct that we're looking at, as Maureen mentioned. And I want to turn to you, Maureen, to ask a little bit about the um, policy change. And specifically, um, you know, you've written in blog posts before that at the national level, you're not as optimistic, but you're fairly optimistic about policy change within the state and local level. Could you talk about that a little bit for me? Sure. Um, well, I think that, you know, sort of in the national level, you know, I live in D.C. It's just not very pleasant. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's just, I think it's hard to agree on what the problem is. And, and, but I think at, a, at state and local levels, they kind of can't avoid it as, as much, right? So I think, you, see, you know, certainly you've seen more state and locals raise their minimum wage, for example, right? That's sort of, um, and I agree, you need some that are sort of jobs that like I had in college and that sort of thing, right? But when I was in college, the minimum wage was worth more, right? So, you know, uh, and college costs less, right? So I, I have a colleague who says, you know, what you used to, for a state sort of flagship school, be able to work, you know, one year full time, at, a, at the minimum wage and be able to pay for a year of college and now you have to work four years at that level, right? So it's, a, a pay for four years of college. Anyway, so it's, so it's you know, it's really the, both the, the erosion of the minimum wage and the rising cost of living affects even college students that are trying to sort of use those entry level jobs to, to, to make ends meet. But at state and local areas, you see some uh, addressing of sort of those kinds of things, but also addressing things that are sort of these you know, as we've moved to a service sector kinds of things, looking at the stable scheduling issues, right? So, you know, it, you know, with your industrial jobs, they had more sort of regular hours. Um, with service jobs, you could be asked to work, you know, at night, on the weekend. Um, the whole thing of on-call scheduling was something that New York State just decided to say, no, you can't have somebody required to sit at home by their phone uh, and come in if you happen to have something, or you have to, or if you, if they show up to work and then you tell them that actually we've decided we don't need you to clock in, you still have to pay them for part of their shift because they came, right? So, so having some of those protections so that people's time, which is how they make their money, is somewhat protected, right? Um, the, um, other things, uh, Washington State has done things with portable benefits, so people have access and a, a more affordable way to buy into benefits pools. Um, uh, California and New Jersey have developed sort of a way of developing a social insurance system for paid family and medical leave. So if you have to leave work because of a long-term illness or, or you're having a child or something like that, there's something to, to give you that cushion because at today's wage levels, who saved up for three months of not earning an income, right? Nobody. So, so having some of those different policies to try to figure out what are the things that, that people need, so they don't, you know, if they if they run into a small problem, it doesn't have to become a catastrophic problem, and it helps people get back into work a heck of a lot more easily. Mm -hmm. Those are a few examples. You know, if I if I could, I, I think sometimes when you have this conversation, it sounds like a conversation about poor people. But, but this is an equation for all of us to solve. And, and one thing I wanted to bubble up is Chicago's done some interesting work through uh, Metropolitan po uh, Policy Council uh, to quantify the impact of not addressing these needs, uh, these issues adequately. And I just wanted to just touch on a couple of them. The correlation between segregation and its uh, principal derivative being poverty. Uh, they've identified that it's cost, it costs the city of Chicago $4.4 .4 billion a year in lost income that it, it, uh, not addressing this need uh, contributes to a 30% higher homicide rate. And that 83,000 bachelor degrees are lost a year. And so if you say that a different way, that's $4.4 .4 billion that could be added to that local economy annually if this were seen, perceived, and addressed as a real issue for everyone. That's 83,000 bachelor's degrees that could be added to that local economy, and that's uh, a decrease in the homicide rate of 30%. And so I, I think it's important that we reshape this conversation because it's easy to fall into a dialogue to talk about people over there. Mm -hmm. But what happened over there is happening over here. And, and so this is a conversation that has to involve all of us and, and it has to evolve beyond the dialogue, uh, I think well said. On the local and regional levels, we know what the problem is. We've solved for far more complex things 
This is really a matter of will. Uh, and are folks willing to see others who may or may not be like them do as well as them or better? If we can start to solve for that, if you can be okay with me being your neighbor or someone else being your neighbor or me okay with, being you, uh, with you being my neighbor, uh, I think these are the conversations that aren't really had, but these are the barriers that affect how folks are casting votes, whether that's nationally or otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. One thing I wanted to talk about, because um, I've mentioned it with all three of you, I think, is this idea of um, a, a strategy towards building quality jobs is, is employee stock ownership programs. Um, is there an example you can think of, maybe Maureen or Jill, um, of an, a company that's done this successfully and really it's helped them build better quality jobs? Well, okay. Go ahead. Um, we do have local examples. So. Yeah. yeah. So, well, first of all, I guess I guess um, I'm I'm trying to um, let's see. So I can think about you know we had a conversation um, uh, about this as part of our conversation series um, last May, and there was one company, Comsonics, that talked about sort of how when they implemented employee stock ownership. Um, it really kind of improved some of the operations and engagement in, in the in the company. Um, so I think that you know, but I think it's also more common than than you realize. And there's different ways to give people ownership. So actually, Southwest Airlines is a company that has you know significant employee ownership um, to it. So I think that I think that using employee ownership as a management um, system is oh, and it can come in many forms it can be esops you there's co-ops so there's um and i've seen cooperatives that are you know they tend to be smaller scale but they can use employee ownership as a way to engage and, and improve the job as, as well as improve operations um, there's different kinds of profit sharing uh, a company marlin steel um, they implemented a significant profit sharing uh, strategy as part of their turnaround strategy, and it became their turnaround strategy. Sorry, getting a little excited here. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think their story is super interesting. He took over this company that was a, um, you know, it was sort of a wire bending company, and they mainly made things like bagel baskets and basic kinds of things. And, and he went into the company and it was not making very much money. It was, um, had a lot of safety issues. It had a lot of uh, problems to it. And he basically started reorganizing the work into, into little teams. And those little teams, every month if they, or three weeks, depending on what the particular project was, if they met their, if they met their goals, they got you know a significant profit sharing, right? So the, profit, the way he structured the profit sharing was that it became something regular that people got. And you know, and that con and that contributed to the worker engagement, and then the company doing better, and then them being able to expand into more profitable product lines, and then them making more money, and then the workers making more money, and right, like so, you got into this virtuous cycle. And the way he talks about it is sort of like when I first came to the, took over this company, the parking lot was cracked, and it didn't really matter because nobody had cars or could afford cars anyway, and now. The parking lot is repaved and it's full, and I can't find a place to park because all my hoop workers can afford a car, yeah. and you know, and it's really and the company's doing great, right? So, um, so I think it's I think really that that the way to think about employee ownership is one of several ways to engage your workers in the success of the company. And if you have a shared success model, that can really be a positive driver of the business. Jill, did you want to add something? I mean, I just wanted, and there are others in the room also who can speak to this, but um, there is you know, an employee-owned uh, cooperative model um, mm -hmm. called Evergreen Cooperatives here, and really leveraging an anchor-based economic development strategy. And so, um, and, and we, part they operate in a number of different ways but I mean we partner very closely for example to um, provide some of their you know initial workers um, they have um, um, you know a, a car ownership and home ownership opportunities there's continuing education opportunities um, and then there's profit sharing once you become a member you know of the cooperative so of, of the cooperative so it is a model here and 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 I think um, is also growing and they're looking for you know opportunities to see whether there's there's more opportunity to convert other businesses to um, employee ownership because of these benefits mm -hmm. and can I just say one more thing about that because you know one of the things is you know I, I talk about some of these stories and people think that just can't be right right and so I had um, 
uh, Drew Greenblatt, who's the CEO of Marlin Steel, and I had him come to the Aspen Institute to be on this panel, and I invited Stephen Perlstein, who's a business columnist for the Washington Post, to moderate the conversation. And, and, and it was really kind of interesting, because you could tell during the conversation, Stephen Perlstein is just not believing Drew Greenblatt's answers about how much is he paying people and how he shares profits mm -hmm. and how that actually was the turnaround strategy for his company. He's just not buying it, right? Mm -hmm. But then Drew's like, okay, come out and visit my company, right? Come see it. So goes out and sees it. A few weeks later, I see a column by Stephen Perlstein talking about this great company, Marlin Steel, and what an amazing thing this is, right? So I think there's also a mind shift thing that we need to, to kind of get to is that we can succeed together. We really can if we want to. So I, I do think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. Thank you. I'm Ann Glosser, Managing Producer at IdeaStream, and today we're listening to a forum on building opportunity in today's labor market, featuring Maureen Conway, Vice President for Policy Programs and Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program at the Aspen Institute, Jill Rezica, Executive Director of Towards Employment, and Michael Jeans, President and CEO of Growth Opportunity Partners. Uh, we're about to begin the audience Q&A portion, and we welcome questions from everyone. Uh, I'm looking at you guys, right? Uh, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you who are jo joining us via our radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator, coordinator Bliss Davis and City Club intern Sophia Brewer Thompson. And maybe we have the first question. Good afternoon. First, uh, thank you to our panelists. It's a great conversation. Um, uh, just a couple months ago, the Federal Reserve Banks of Cleveland and Philadelphia uh, issued a national report on what we call opportunity occupations. These are um, jobs that pay above the national uh, median wage for those without college degrees. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, I, I see the, the job growth here, the growing jobs in Cleveland, great, high, good paying jobs, but how can we ensure that uh, those without college degrees are able to access those jobs? And maybe more specifically, what can the workforce systems um, do to help ensure that there are pathways to those jobs for those without the, uh, the college degrees? You know, I'll take a, just an initial stab at that. I, I think we are extending the, conversations, uh, the conversation of jobs a bit longer than its useful life. And so the pursuit of a job creates a function of a wage, but it doesn't really do much else. Uh, you know, so we have the, the opportunity careers, and I think that's the right conversation. But if we really look out beyond the curve, our, our competition isn't just you and I for a job. We're, we're now looking out and seeing robotics being a very real competitor. We're seeing automation and AI being real competitors to work. And so uh, as we connect people to jobs as we must, uh, to your point, college isn't for, hmm, college isn't the solution that everyone chooses. I won't say it's not for everyone, but it's not the solution that everyone chooses. And if they don't choose college, there should be an opportunity to earn a good wage and live uh, a, a satisfying life. But I think we're having conversations about jobs that maybe should have expired uh, by now. And we should be talking about skill sets. It's no longer where I go to work and, and fill a, a job application and, and, and get approved, but it's, you know, what are my competencies? What, am I, uh, what have I mastered such that someone needs to reach out for me to deploy that mastered skill? Uh, but if we continue to, to tell our children to pursue a job, when it's time for them to earn a meaningful wage, that job will likely not be relevant. And so we need to transition the conversation, I think, from uh, jobs to careers and to competencies. And quickly, the other part to your, your question around the system side of it, uh, you know, I, I think we also, from the, um, the company side, need to recognize that uh, the obvious is the labor line item is the largest, but that also represents people. And so we have to, uh, interestingly, uh, it, it, it's the expense side. And so labor and people are viewed in companies from that accounting perspective as a liability, and we really need to shift that thinking and that conversation so that the people who we speak of as assets are, are treated as such. Um, I guess to jump into the, the workforce system conversation and how do we, as we're, we're shifting this mindset um, and thinking about building the, the competencies, and I love, 
um, the focus on the competencies per se, um, but we're still, how do we get someone who, even if they have a high school diploma or a GED, are amongst you know the 40% who are still operating at a fourth grade math and reading level. How do you help that person connect to education training experience so that they can gain the competencies that are needed by the current set of jobs and getting ready for the, f the future set of jobs? So I think um, uh, part of that is um, you know when we think across the, the the workforce system, it's made up of so many different actors, and that's why people have likened the workforce system to a bowl of spaghetti. You know, you pull here, what, where do you even focus? And I think that we are making progress in, in our community, and Maureen can talk about how it's happened in many many other communities um, through really trying to organize with the. Um, support of the Workforce Development Board and philanthropy and, um, and, 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 and government coming together and creating um, sector partnerships. So really trying to bring the employers together to clarify what are their needs, what are the competencies that you're actually looking for, what credentials or experience translate, you know, give you confidence that people have those, those competencies, and then how can we work together to help folks who don't yet have those um, foundational skill sets start to, to, to grow into to, to gaining those competencies. Um, and it's not just about the supply side. It's what all the things that we've just talked about, about where are the employers in, in partnering together to create earn and learn opportunities, to create on-ramps that says, OK, we are not yet at the experience level that um, I would have hired somebody 10 years ago when there was um, a loose labor market, but here's how we're going to partner together. Somebody who can't afford to take time off to go get this, you know, credential. Um, how can we work together to build your skills while you're, you know, at um, at the workplace? Um, so it's really, I think, coming together to to try to um, to, to to work together to solve uh, that challenge, knowing that um, we have to create some on ramps. Some of that work is really done prior to getting um, into that partnership with the employer, but then there's many steps that will need to be done in partnership with the employer. And I think we're finding many employers coming to the table to do that. So I just want to make two quick points. One is I think we read too much into, you know, we do too much dividing people up into you people have college and you people don't, right? And so mm -hmm. you people must be skilled and you people must not be skilled, right? So. The New York uh, Federal Reserve actually did some interesting work looking at sort of the situation of people with college degrees, and they found, you know, basically a third of college degree holders are in jobs that don't require a college degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's even more for people who are recent college graduates. Um, so, the, so you know, I think that that we do do too much of that. And second of all, I guess I would say, you know, people without college degrees still have many skills and many abilities, and just because somebody doesn't have a college degree doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to contribute at work. And, and the other thing I guess I, I want to say on that point is that a lot of learning happens at work and also that you can structure work so that it encourages learning and growth, right? Or you can structure work so that it encourages skill atrophy and you're having somebody repeat tasks that they don't even understand, right? So, you know, I think that we want to think about where do people build skills that are useful and then how do we sort of lift that up and, and be able to make that visible. But I, I think sometimes we've, we hang just too much weight on the, on the college, non-college, and partly that's just a function of that's the easy data to get in, in some sense. But. Interesting. We got a, another question? Hi, Grace Heffernan with Towards Employment. Um, I had a question about, um, you know, as, as providers, often when we're implementing job quality strategies or workforce strategies, you know, we're asked about the ROI and what's the business case, what's the dollars and cents savings of it. And what I'm hearing Michael say is that there's this like greater moral imperative that, you know, it's just the right thing to do. And, and frankly, the, the business case in some ways um, perpetuates this notion of labor as a line item, and that's something we want to move past. So my question is around how do you balance those two things when you're working with employers, ROI and the moral imperative for job quality strategies? Um, and then also, if we're not going to use the business case, how do you measure your success so that we're not reinforcing um, this, this budgetary mindset? I think the business case speaks, case speaks for itself. I don't believe that uh, we can find mass success in compelling immoral people to be moral. Uh, so the business case should speak for itself. When it comes to the character of the business owner or the person, that's separate uh, and, and it will show regardless of the dialogue. So 
Uh, I would take the moral conversation of this off the table because this isn't an act of benevolence. This isn't a conversation of doing some people a favor. You know, this is, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it should be unspoken that it's the right thing to do. Uh, but the business case suggests that if you don't have diverse persons around the table, you don't get the person inputs, and so the outputs are limited. That's an old, old University of Michigan business case. <laughs> so, you know, as, as we think about, uh, you know, what the business case is, I think Chicago did a great job of quantifying that, and, and, you, and you can apply that uh, to basically any city USA. Thanks, and let's, uh, we have another question here, I believe. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Hannah Halbert with Policy Matters Ohio. Thanks for the conversation. And I'm curious what the panelists think about the role of workplace democracy, so either traditional labor collective bargaining or through alternative forms like a worker center with workers and community coming together uh, in building opportunity. What's their role in this conversation? And how can organizations like those present here in the room, either through workforce development or or uh, providing services to job seekers wherever they fall. How can they help support that conversation? Maureen, would you like to take this? Sure. Um, so I think of a couple different models of workplace democracy. Um, so one is coworker.org, which actually is an interesting organization that does kind of some <coughs> online organizing of workers so that they can kind of lift up what are some of the issues that they have in, at work. Um, they sort of were in the news a lot around getting Starbucks to change its dress code so that people with visible tattoos could actually let them show at work and they didn't have to have really long sleeves and all this kind of thing. So, I mean, right, they, like, like, I don't work at Starbucks, but, you know, so these are the issues that come up. And, and so I think uh, it's a good example, though, of having a way to sort of communicate up something. And I think this is the important thing about workforce democracy is that having a way to communicate out something um, that the management's just not thinking of and they don't have those communication systems. So I think workforce democracy is a really important thing. Um, so that's one organization for sort of the, the modern era, but worker centers are, are really important. Um, different kinds of labor organizations are really important. I think um, employee ownership actually can be a way of also empowering workers to, as workers feel like owners and they can pr participate more in sort of the, the they don't necessarily you know, run the company, right? But they have more of a feeling of ownership and engagement in stakeholder and stakeholder and their input is more taken into account. So there's a lot of different models. And, I, and it's interesting because I think on the one hand, you hear workers who want to hear, hear, be respected for their contributions and they want to be heard and have their um, opinions asked. They have sometimes been in a workplace a long time. They'd like to be heard from. Um, and on the other hand, you hear from from business leaders who say we really struggle with employee engagement, right? And so it's sort of like you know there's some solutions for this, right? And and I and I think that um, it's it's really important to sort of lift up those different ideas. They can really really be a useful way to do it. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon to the panel. Thank you so much for an engaging conversation. Um, one of the things that I noticed even a couple days ago as I watched the presidential debate in the 60 second sound bites that Dan Walthorpe was talking about earlier, one of the things that the candidate uh, Andrew Yang, if I remember correctly, talked about was this idea of universal basic income and trying to overcome the automation of uh, the labor market. And um, so, what was an interesting part of that is that he also was the number one uh, person who increases Twitter followers. So there was <laughs> clearly, a, a, an, I guess, interest, at least in the topic. So as a region, as a state, as a country, are we prepared? Uh, Michael, you spoke about automation earlier. Are we prepared for this conversation of automation and the impact on the labor market um, as a means of uh, trying to find solutions to build opportunity? Are we ready for that? Yeah, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'll just give you some quick numbers. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, I'm a data-driven kind of guy. McKinsey uh, did a, a study that, that suggests that 60% of occupations uh, would be at least 30% automated by t the year 2030. Said a different way, uh, roughly a third of U.S. workers would be jobless by 2030 uh, due to automation. Uh, to your question, I, I think it's the right conversation to have around labor. Uh, we have to insert more innovation in these conversations in low-income communities and for low-income persons. And, we, and if we continue to pull out the same playbooks, uh, we're just not going to get the results that we need to have. Uh, the reality is automation is, you know, this is the toothpaste you can't put back in the tube. 
it's going to happen. Was it our dear friend Stephen Hawking? AI will be mankind's greatest, uh, I'll summarize, uh, uh, achievement, but it will be our last. You know, this is the boulder that's running down the hill and we're not able to stop it. And so I think it's a bit of a defeatist approach to try to avoid it. And the question is, how do we compete? We're at our best when we compete. And so are capital markets, by the way. And so I don't think we take that off of the table, but what are the things we do to allow ourselves to compete? That's where the competencies come in. And we can't keep telling kids that things aren't for them. I think kids hear enough of what's not for them. And so let's open the box. Let's let some folks uh, take a swing at things and give us a different approach to, to, to getting things done. Uh, but if we're going to compete against uh, AI and robotics, it has to start with an intense uh, application of improving competencies or the gap will widen. The income gap will widen. Uh, the wealth gap will then as a result widen. Our inner city schools have not been able to show the same level of performance as other schools. And, and if we're still talking about uh, the things of yesterday and how to earn a living, then we're that much farther away from that many thousands of students in our cities to be able to compete with other students who are at the forefront of innovation and who are ready and prepared to take on automation and AI. I think it's a great question, and there are some folks smarter than me who can help us go the distance on it. We'll have to leave it there, but thank you guys for a great discussion. Thank you, Anne. I'm Dan Malthrop, and today at the City Club, we've been listening to a forum on building opportunity in today's labor market. Thank all of you for joining us today. That brings us to the end of our forum. Thank you, Ms. Conway, Mr. Jeans, Ms. Rizica, and Ms. Glosser for moderating. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club. Our forum is adjourned. Have a great weekend. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.